is CBIS graduation 2013. Hi, Drew. Hi, Doug. <laughs> Lots of people here. I think we're going to be starting soon. It's the porters. Hi there. <laughs> here are the Sims. Uh oh. <laughs> He's using Morris code to communicate with us. Good evening. Welcome to the 2013 graduation ceremonies. I'm very thankful that you're all here to uh, join in this momentous occasion for this year's graduates. Um, before we begin, I'd like to thank the many volunteers that helped to put this on. Some of you are here tonight. Mrs. Kong, who I know here, um, was able to decorate a lot of this auditorium, and we thank her for her volunteer help on that. My assistant, um, Ms. Linda Young, did a lot of work um, in the build-up to, to putting on a graduation, so I thank her for that. And the many CDIS teachers and other volunteers have also had a part in tonight's graduation. And also the other parents who um, were able to help out in different ways. Um, thank you to all of you. Um, tonight, um, this is just a, a great time every year to celebrate with these students who have been working for many, many years to come to this point. And so tonight we just really get to celebrate with them, and I hope that all that you experience and all that we're involved in tonight will really just be a reflection of us being able to join together with them um, to celebrate and to enjoy their accomplishment um, and to appreciate all that they've done. And so I think we'll have a great time. Um, I'm going to sit down now, and the graduates are going to enter soon.
I'd like to open our time this evening in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these students and the wonderful privilege we have tonight to celebrate this accomplishment with them. We thank you, Lord, for all the good gifts you have given to them and for the blessing, for blessing them with the rewards of their hard work. We thank you, Lord, that you have kept them healthy and kept them to this day so that they could experience the completion of their, um, their high school education. We know, Lord, that you have big plans for them, and we know that you will keep them and sustain them to the end. And we praise you and we thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs> As secondary principal, it's my privilege to make a few opening remarks. Uh, as I was thinking about graduation, I thought about my own graduation, um, which took place in a small town in the northeast corner of the United States many years ago, in the same town where once lived the famous American poet Robert Frost. It was Mr. Frost who penned the famous poem you probably heard, The Road Less Traveled. And he opens that poem with this line, Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry, I could not travel both. When I think of this poem, I think of our graduates tonight. In many ways, tonight represents a fork in their road. Our graduates will choose which direction they will go from here. This also reminds me of something that Jesus said in the Gospels. He said, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so I want to remind the graduates to pursue treasures while here on earth that have lasting value. Robert Frost ends his famous poem with these lines, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I chose the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. At this point, I'd like to introduce the two people that are on stage with me. The first is Miss Debbie Sue Blank, our head principal. The second is Dr. Phil Bassett, our speaker tonight. He's the director of teacher training for ISC schools. We have um, what I think you'll find is an interesting graduation. We've decided that we want the students to present to you some of their talents and their interests at their graduation. And so I've given them the freedom to choose what they would like to do this evening. And so they're going to do several different things throughout the course of this graduation ceremony. And so I'm going to invite the seniors now to, to do their first performance.
And this year it was a very, very close race and we had a lot of students who have done very well and have consistently earned excellent grades throughout the, uh, the years that they've been here. And tonight I would like to tell you that our salutatorian, sorry, salutatorian award goes to Lauren Yi. And our valedictorian is Davis Campbell. Davis Campbell, and tonight I have the honor of representing my class as the valedictorian. Um, to start off, on behalf of my class, I'd just like to thank uh, our teachers, our principals, and our parents, and whoever else in our lives has um, contributed to getting us here today. Um, I'd just like to thank you for how you've patiently and graciously served us over the years uh, to get us here. So here we are at our graduation. It's the day we knew would come, but didn't think would come quite so fast. Uh, it's the day that we look back upon our past with fond nostalgia, and look forward to the future with uncertain excitement. The day that we've reserved to mourn and to celebrate, to reminisce and to imagine what might become of us. On this day, we take that official first step into the real world that we've heard so much about from our parents and our teachers. So on this day, what do I have to say? I'm the valedictorian, I have to give this valediction, uh, which means the last word, uh, even though I won't be the last person to speak tonight. Um, so what do I have to say? What, how could I possibly fill this role? It's kind of a lot of pressure for me. Uh, so as I was writing this speech, I considered a few options. I considered maybe I can give this super inspiring speech, but so often that ends up being this cheesy, collection of cliches. Reach for the stars, fulfill all your dreams, stuff like that. Um, I thought maybe I could go a sentimental, emotional route, um, talking about how much we'll miss each other. And there's a place for that, but I don't think that it's right here. And I also thought about giving a super funny speech, but I don't think I can pull that off right now. Uh, I'm not feeling in the mood for that. Um, so instead I decided to tell you about some random observation I made uh, a few days ago and comment on that observation a few times. So, a while ago the kindergarten class graduated from kindergarten to first grade, and it made me think, why do kindergartners have a graduation ceremony? Um, and the most immediate answer that comes to my head is because it's cute, because the parents <laughs> want to see them uh, dress up in gowns and sing a nice song. But then I thought, maybe it's the same reason that we have this graduation ceremony. It's because the ceremony marks an important change in their lives. And we may look at that and think, well, they're kindergartners, how big of a change is that really? But we also have to consider the fact that they are kindergartners. It's 
a big change to them, even though it looks small to us. Uh, the experiences that we've had since our kindergarten graduation make it look smaller. In the scheme of things, it doesn't feel as significant to us anymore. So that made me think. Right now we're being confronted by a bigger change than we've ever faced before. We're going to be scattered around the world. We're going to have to say goodbye to our family and our friends. We're going to experience a level of freedom and responsibility that we've never had before. And yet, despite how huge this change is, I can't help but wonder if in a few years we'll look back and think, that wasn't that big of a deal. Because in the scheme of things, it's not. Millions of people graduate. It's a fact. Millions of people every year go through this graduation experience that we have. People leave their families and friends and start new lives. In this time, it's normal. And that's the paradox. The changes we face in the near future, as extraordinary as they are, are also pretty ordinary. They're things that are faced by numerous people that almost everybody can expect to face at some point uh, in their life. And I think this matters because often we think that living an extraordinary life and living an ordinary life are mutually exclusive. They're things that can't happen at the same time. But I think that you can live an extraordinary life by living a normal life. Take this graduation, for instance. To us, it's definitely special, but there is definitely a sense in which it is not special. Um, there's seven billion people in this world that couldn't care less about this graduation. Um, in fact, they literally couldn't care less because they don't know that it's happening, probably will never know that it's happening. Um, but at the same time, it's significant to us because it impacts each of our lives. It's the same with all of our lives. If you look at the universe, Inside the universe are millions and millions, probably billions of galaxies. So those galaxies are like specks in the universe. And our solar system is like a speck in one galaxy. And then Earth is like a speck in that solar system. And we're like specks on the Earth. So we're like specks to the fourth degree. So how can our lives have any significance? Well, in the scheme of things, they don't. Like, you look at the universe, we're not going to have any impact on, in the scheme of things. But... The significance that we have comes from the fact that we impact the lives of those around us. And also that we are significant to God. And this is what I want us all to remember. I want us all to remember that God has a plan for our lives to be significant. Whether that's in an extraordinary, uh, by worldly standards way, like leading a country. Or a normal, by worldly standards way, like leading a family or doing your job to the best of your ability. That's what I really want us to remember tonight. So let's go out into the world, uh, fellow graduates, let's go out into the world and live the lives that God has planned for us and be extraordinary. I'd now like to um, introduce to you and ask them to come up to the stage our next performance, which will be Deanna, Davis, Shane, Samuel, and Youngman.
graduation we ask a member of the Student Advisory Council to address the parents and families and so this year we've asked the one of the executive members of the Student Advisory Council Deanna John to come and give a speech. Hi everyone I'm Deanna John. I've been in CDS for the past four years and I've loved the time I've had with this class of 2013. Sorry, there was something on there. During one of the senior speeches, which I think most of you still remember if you were there, the speaker asked the rhetorical question of, what do you think of this generation? I don't think I'm quite experienced enough to answer that deep philosophical slash analytical question that involves millions of people in this world. But today I want to pose a more practical question that most of us have thought of during this time of year. What do you think about this class? This class, these people in front of you right here, whom you've raised, taught, or hung out with, and whose lives you've witnessed or influenced. There might be just about 95.6 million words or phrases you can use to describe our class, like the largest graduating class in CDI's history, the class that's sleepiest in worldview, the class of pretty girls, the class of no pretty girls, the class of nerds, or the class of slackers, the class of crazy people who think they should eat freshmen, the class of friendliness, impact, leadership, etc. But the word that God has put in my mind is wisdom. The class of wisdom. It may sound vague and huge and so far down the road that we can only achieve something like that when we have a class reunion in 60 years and we're all, we're all old and then we can gather all our life experiences, raise our glasses and say, cheers to the class of wisdom. But wisdom can also be simple. It means that all the good choices and many achievements we've made up to this point in our lives. It means all the effort we poured into shaping the school in our own ways. It means the positive impact we've made on important people in our lives. And it means continuing all that into the future. However, it doesn't mean that we have ever or maybe even want to accomplish all that with our own limited knowledge. 
but only through the fear of God. Proverbs chapter 1 says, My son, if sinners entice you, do not give in to them. My son, do not go along with them. Do not set foot on their paths, for their feet rush into sin. They are swift to shed blood. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease, without fear of harm. And I'm sure when God says harm, it's not just physical harm, but things that harm our mind and soul and prevent us from pursuing wisdom and ultimately prevent us from the things we want to achieve in life. The goals and dreams we have now or will have in the future. Moreover, I don't mean to be cliche, but I'm humbled and honored extremely today to thank, thank you all on behalf of our class for making us the people who we are and for shaping us into the class we are right now. Lastly, I will say something I said during our pre-graduation ceremony in Hong Kong. Hey, people, right here. <laughs> After today, when I miss you guys, I know you'll be missing me too, hopefully. <laughs> and when I feel like I'm getting too old and ugly, I know you guys will be growing old and ugly with me. <laughs> and when I feel like I'm discouraged and digressing from wisdom and the path of the Lord, I know I can call out to any of you for just an encouragement or a prayer. So cheers to the class of wisdom, to the CDIS class of 2013. We'll be the class forever. Thank you. We have one more performance tonight, so I'd like to invite Judy, Ivy, Heeji, Gloria, Jin Young, and Charity to perform for us. Thank you.
I'm very honored to um, announce the next two awards. Uh, they, this award is for, it's the Axe Award, the most prestigious award that we give at CDIS. The Axe Award stands for Academics, Character, Truth, and Service, and the students who receive this award are students who embody these characteristics. Um, I believe that this faculty, when they met together to decide who was going to get this award, um, it turned out to be a lot more difficult than what they realized it would be. And from 3.14 to 5.10 in the afternoon was how long it took them to deliberate on this. So I want you to know that these people who get this award are very deserving, but it also means that we have other people, other students in this class that also have amazing characteristics um, that make it really difficult for us to uh, distinguish this. So I really would like you to know that these students are quality students. And um, the first, the girl that gets the X Award this year is Charity Kim. is Shane Tog. introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Phil Bassett is the Director of Teacher Training for ISC, of which this school is a member. He has more than 30 years of experience at every level of education, um, and I have learned much from his wisdom and insight. Dr. Bassett and I grew up in the same state um, around the same time, <laughs> and our families have known each other for many years. Dr. Bassett actually worked with my father when my father was a principal of a school like CDIS, and Dr. Bassett was a principal of another school um, in that same area. And so I remember the first year that I was in China, I met Dr. Bassett, and I told him my name. And uh, the first thing we talked about was the fact that we're both Red Sox fans. Um, and so we talked about the Boston Red Sox for a little while, and then he said, wait a second, is your dad Dan Keegan? And so I said, yes. And we realized that our, we had a family connection, and actually I grew up in a town about 20 minutes from where he grew up. Since that time, I've gotten to know Dr. Bassett and his wife. My family has actually stayed in his home. Um, if you don't know Dr. Bassett, him and his wife are probably two of the most hospitable people that I've ever met. Um, and there's hundreds, if not thousands, of people that have actually stayed with them in their home in Beijing. Um, and so they're just fantastic people. Um, they have seven children um, and have um, raised one of those children in China. Um, and so it's really a pleasure to have him here to speak to our students, and so I'd like to introduce him now to come to the stage.
was that? No? Yes? I can hear a little something. Okay, well, being a graduation speaker is hard enough uh, when the microphone works. Um, but I didn't know this was also a speech contest, and I think uh, Deanna and Davis gave two of the uh, finest commencement talks that uh, I've ever heard. And so I know I can't do worse than third place in this speech contest, so I'm, I'm going to forge ahead. It's really special for me to be here this evening. I can remember uh, maybe my second year in China when none of these buildings around here were here, and uh, CDIS was a hole in the ground and, and uh, praying for this school. And now to think that uh, the last commencement uh, address, or the last commencement here in this building, uh, to get a chance to speak to you is, is really an honor. So distinguished guests, CDIS teachers and students, Mr. Keegan, Ms. Blanks, a class of 2013, parents and families. Uh, Lin Chowder was born in 1901 in a small uh, fishing village on a small island off the coast of the island city of Xiamen. Uh, in those days, there were many uh, Christian schools in China, and there was a small Christian school on the island, and she attended that school. Uh, both of her parents were teachers, and she studied hard and became an excellent student. She said, if boys can get a grade of 100, then I'll get 110. <laughs> but one hot summer day, she was uh, knitting during a break time, and one of her teachers said to her, you have such great hands, you should become a doctor. This comment changed the direction of her life. Uh, Lin went on to apply for admission to Beijing Union Medical Hospital and University in Beijing, which was associated with the New York State University School of Medicine. She left her little island village and journeyed to Shanghai, first time she'd been uh, away from Xiamen, and she uh, took the entrance exam. For her, this was the opportunity of a lifetime well, during the long, hot hours of the exam, uh, one, of the, one of her fellow students fainted and fell from her chair and just lay on the floor. Nobody moved. Everybody just focused on their exam. Well, after just a very short time, Lin knew she had to do something. She was a Christian. She had to help this fellow student, uh, no matter what it meant for her. So she helped this young lady to her feet, I took her outside for some fresh air, got her some food and water, made sure she was okay, and then went back in to work on the exam. Well, quickly, the time for the exam was over, and she was not even close to finishing hers. But she turned in her exam anyway and, and left. Uh, she was not disappointed. She was not upset. She hoped that she would get another chance to apply the next year, but she knew she'd done the right thing. and. And so she went home. As she said later, life is precious. While some things may be considered more valuable than life, to a person, nothing is more precious than their own life. Well, unbeknownst to her, the examiner sent her exam along to Beijing with a note as to why it wasn't completed. And the uh, university was impressed with her selflessness, uh, with her fast acting, and they knew that even though her exam was incomplete, it still showed that she was quite knowledgeable and had a good grasp of English. So much to her surprise, she got a letter of acceptance and headed off to Beijing to medical school. Well, she started in 1921, and by 1925, she, along with only 60% of her classmates, received a uh, medical doctor's degree from the New York State University. Well, she had specialized in uh, obstetrics and gynecology, and she very quickly distinguished herself as an excellent doctor. And in 1932, she was the first woman to be named the head of a department in a hospital in China. And she was the head of obstetrics and gynecology at the Beijing Union Hospital. At first, her male counterparts looked down on her, but soon she won their respect and their trust and she began slowly to reform the practice of obstetrics, greatly improving health care for mothers and newborns in her hospital, in Beijing, and then across China. 
Well, throughout her career, Dr. Lin went on to hold many high national positions. For example, she was the Deputy Director of the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences, and she was also the Vice Chair of the National Women's Federation of China. She frequently traveled to Europe and North America, uh, both lecturing and learning. Uh, she was an author, a book and journal editor, and she actually became a role model for a whole generation of Chinese women. And yet, even though she was famous, there are many stories of her going out late at night to help women deliver their babies if they were in trouble. Even if they couldn't pay her, she often used her own money to buy them food and basic medicine. She said, if they entrust me with their life, how can I refuse that trust saying I'm cold or hungry or tired? Well, by 1975, at age 74, she was still practicing medicine. And she was even delivering babies once in a while. Well, in those days, a young mother from Shandong province traveled the hundreds of miles to Beijing to ask for help. She was pregnant and could find no doctor to deliver her baby because she had a heart condition. They were afraid she would die during the delivery process. She had heard of Dr. Lin, and so she appealed to her for help. And of course, Dr. Lin said yes. And she helped her to deliver a healthy baby boy one of the last babies of the thousands she delivered over her career. Five years later, she had a stroke, and then a couple of years after that, she died in 1983. Well, later on, both the mother and that little boy became Christians. And the little boy grew up to go on to university and graduate from university, and now he works for ISC in Beijing. Uh -huh. He's my colleague, he's my friend, he's married to a Christian teacher, and he himself has a strong, healthy little boy. Graduates, it's really my honor to speak to you today on this very special day when your family, your community, your society recognize that you've started a new phase in your life. Uh, Mr. Keegan and, and Davis have referred to that. Uh, the adolescent child is almost gone. And soon, if not already, <coughs> you'll be a young adult. It is one of the important milestones of your life. It's full of joy and good times. And your hearts are full of the joy and good times that you've had at CDIS. But there's also a little bit of sadness uh, the goodbye, uh, for the goodbyes that you'll have to say. Well, I'd like to draw some lessons for you just very briefly from Dr. Lin's story that we can apply. First, let's look at the work that she gave her life to. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, For you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works that God has prepared ahead of time that you should walk in them. It's my strong belief that doing good works is one of the main purposes of our life. It's not how we gain acceptance by God, but finding meaningful work that does good for others is one of the great blessings that life has to offer. Dr. Lin was able to find those good works prepared for her, and she dedicated herself to them, not to fame or riches or a good life, but dedicated herself to what she had found for her calling. And the fame and the riches and the good life kind of naturally followed after that, but they were never the focus of her life. So that's the first lesson. Second lesson is we never know when God is going to use a thought of our heart words of a teacher or friend to change the direction of our life completely. And teachers, you don't know when the words that you've said during the course of a day will stick in a student's mind and they will remember them the rest of their life as a time when the direction of their life slightly changed. So the advice is listen for God's still small voice. Listen to those people that you trust and respect and that have wisdom and look for the work that God has for you to do. Third, the decisions we make, both large and small, good and bad, cast long shadows across our lives and change the path of our life. Uh, the poem that uh, Mr. Keegan quoted is one of my favorites, and I actually was going to quote the whole thing in my uh, address, but it was too long, so I'm glad he at least quoted the best parts. But it's that idea 
There's a point in your life, you make a decision one way or the other, and somewhere ages and ages hence, you'll be telling it with a sigh, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that's made all the difference. So there's these points in your life where that happens. Well, Dr. Lin made the decision to help her fellow student. Even if it was gonna cost her admission to the, to the hospital, she made the right decision, and God took care of her. So uh, look for those points in your life and make the good decisions. Dr. Lean was not afraid to take a risk to help a young mother, and the outcome was amazing. Fourth lesson, your hard work and good choices can affect uh, lives and bless people that you will never know. Uh, Dr. Lean never saw Josiah grow up. But it's neat that I feel this connection with this great woman because the baby whose life she saved is now serving God with us here in China. And fifth, no matter how famous or important you become, you are never too high to help those who are in need. So finally, as you move on to university, I'd like to suggest four Bible passages to help guide you. And I think you'll see very quickly how they fit Dr. Lin's story. And tomorrow, Mr. Keegan is going to give you a piece of paper with the verses on it that I've prepared for you. First is Proverbs 4, verses 23 and 27. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Be very careful in your friendships, especially your boyfriends and girlfriends. Be careful where you hang out at university. Be careful who you let influence you. Find a good fellowship and attend it regularly. Second verse, Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility let each consider others as better than yourself. Each of you should not look out only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now this verse does not say we shouldn't look out for our own interests. It says that we should also look out for the interests of others. What I've noticed over my life, and by the way, Deanna, getting old and ugly don't always go together. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I know you didn't think I was that old. <laughs> What I've noticed over the course of my life is that the, most of the people that truly rise to high positions in greatness uh, have an attitude, they're characterized by having an attitude of serving and helping others. There are some that rise that way because of just a lot of power and they exercise it very strongly. But most uh, get people to be loyal and to work hard for them because they know that this leader cares for them. So don't just care about yourself, care for others, and in the end, it helps you. Third verse, Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Seeking justice as you walk with God in humility and with a merciful heart is a formula for a powerful and successful life. And finally, Luke, chapter 12, verse 48. And your dads especially want you to listen carefully here. To, to whom much is given, much is required. And you, for some reason, have been given a lot by your families, friends, and teachers. You've had the privilege of a great education at a great school with a wonderful bunch of classmates. I mean, the history of your class is that you all help each other to be better. And this is a blessing that's not that common. You've been given a lot, and so a lot is required. Um, you have a responsibility to use what you've been given to bless others. So congratulations. May God go with you. And above all else, guard your heart.
We're now going to present the graduation diplomas to our students. So students, as I call your name, you can come forward and Ms. Blanks will present you with your diploma. Davis Benjamin Campbell. Lauren Macy Yee. Alphonsus Chan Jiawei. 